And it says, the new panel says, the Fed and the ECB in uncharted waters. Um, I'm your moderator for this session. And I'm um, happy to present you um, quickly um, this very short, um, in, a, in a very short um, way, um, the panelists. And um, then we will continue with our three uh, presenters. Um, and after that, um, we will all have time for questions and discussions. And I'm really happy to introduce you to this very distinguished panel that we have here. Um, we have three presenters. Um, and I presented very quickly now in the order as they will also hold the presentation. So we started um, afterwards with um, Adam Posen, who is um, the director and the uh, president of the Peterson Institute for International Economics. Um, then we will continue with uh, Vito Constancio, who is a former vice president of the ECB and um, currently also professor um, for economics at the uh, University of Navarra. And um, our last speaker of this panel will be um, Peter uh, Bofingham, who is um, um, a professor for economics at the um, University of um, um, Würzburg, and um, is also a um, former member of the German Council for Economic Experts. Um, so I'm really happy that we have now um, this set of panelists who will um, speak to us from the position of theory and policy and um, give us the opportunity to learn how monetary policy should look like after the corona crisis. And we know uh, that um, after, as well, the financial crisis of 2008 and 9, monetary policy has gained momentum within Europe, but also with, uh, within the US. So we have um, lots um, of new um, measures and um, so-called unconventional policies which have been undertaken to boost um, inflation rate and to uh, boost again the business cycle. And um, so again, after this uh, crisis, the question arises, was that enough? Is there more to do? Um, what else can the Federal Reserve and um, the ECB, but maybe as well um, also other central banks do um, to promote on the one hand the business cycle, but also to boost um, the real economy. And um, especially on that topic, so what has been done and what should be done um, in the future, our first panelist um, has already lots of abbreviations in his title to give us an overview on um, how multi, um, how, how, many multi how, ang how many angles monetary policy um, can have. So our first uh, presenter is going to be Adam Posen, and the title of his presentation is After Inflation Targeting, Labor Force Participation and Yield Curve Control is what I see for the Federal Reserve Bank and the ECB. Please, Mr. Posen, um, the floor is yours. Thank you, Professor Sprengler. Um, I, my title was perhaps misleading, but was meant to be read with the acronyms because it sounds better. After IT, I propose YCC and LFP for the ECB and FRB, but so it goes. Um, I'm grateful to Peter Bofinger uh, and the organizers of the FFM conference for inviting me and to get to appear with Peter and another old friend and colleague, Peter Costanzio. Um, I fear, or I am glad, but for purposes here, there will be a lot of agreement between uh, Vitor, Peter, and I. But so maybe in my specifics, there will be some difference. I think we have to start with the recognition of how far monetary policy has come in the last six, nine months, particularly by the Fed and the ECB, as opposed to where we were pre-corona pandemic, and as opposed to where we were in 2008 to 12. Um, but I think that has to be seen against a background of very real limitations on what monetary policy can do, as our moderator said, in terms of impact on the real economy environment we're in. And the environment we're in, I would start to argue, try to argue, is one of ongoing secular stagnation in the Larry Summers or Alan Hansen sense, and therefore a period of long 
low interest rates, low long interest, low, excuse me, inflation, low animal spirits and in private sector investment. The coronavirus is making worse. Human terms, of course, totally changes the game. But in economic terms, I actually think it's just a further reinforcement of the long term. Now, let me get into the monetary policy. If you had told me six, eight, nine months ago that central bankers would be less hated than public, public health officials, more left to do their own policies without political interference, I would have said you were crazy. We were coming out of a period of huge political pressure on and criticism of bankers. And instead, what we've seen is just that. We've seen the central bankers acting aggressively uh, in, in February, March, April of this year, uh, and big steps taken just recently by the Federal Reserve to change its policy framework in, I think, very sound ways. Uh, big steps being put forward by ECB President Lagarde and by Chief Economist uh, Philip Blaine and others and Isabel Schnabel to modernize the ECB's approach. Um, this is very striking, and, and it's been effective in the sense that you very quickly had these blob lines and liquidity arrangements across national borders and stabilized the situation. And incredibly, although this is not just due to the central banks, we've even seen a large flow back of capital into the emerging markets and developing countries. Not enough to obviate the need for massive deep debt restructuring and aid but enough to suggest that the monetary financial connections have stabilized to an incredible extent. So I, I think we, we have to start with that recognition, but that just reinforces the monetary policy limitations we're all under. That as Jay Powell has said, as Christine Lagarde has said, as I think all of us in this panel would agree, the fiscal policy that we've seen for the last six months and that we need to see I hope for not too much longer, um, is the source of recovery, is the source of protection, workers and people. Um, I think you see the heads of these major central banks speaking about very explicit fiscal and monetary cooperation and coordination, which is, of course, a complete 180 degree turn, particularly from the ECB, what we saw during the global financial crisis, or rather the euro crisis, in particular from 2010 to 2012. Um, I don't think this ever should have been so fraught and difficult to get to this point. Uh, I, I gave a speech when I was at the Bank of England policy on the Monetary Policy Committee in 2011, calling out the then president of the Bundesbank and others who were attacking the ECB and who are attacking the fiscal policy and pointing out that central bank independence isn't about just always saying no, it's, some, it's about choosing when to cooperate. And only an adolescent always says no. An adult may be independent, but still voluntarily cooperate. And maybe it was a factor, a factor of the fact that in age, the ECB was still an adolescent at that time. But I think there is no reason you can't have loose cooperation between monetary and fiscal authorities as long as it's transparently done and as long as the central bank retains the option to exit the arrangement when it chooses. And that's where we're coming to. And, and so I think there's been a lot of academic teeth gnashing and some actually, frankly, crazy proposals over the last few years to make things fancy about how you, you delegate fiscal authority to monetary authorities or how you coordinate. I don't think we need that. Um, in fact, I think it is it is better if it's just very visible and informal, which is why I will come back to the idea of yield curve control, which I think is the most sensible, robust option available right now for how to do it. Um, but I would also point out that there are advantages, I'd be interested in the first views, having experienced this his point of view, in having the central bank have restraints on what it says to fiscal. Um, again, when I was at the Bank of England in 2010, uh, the then Governor Mervyn King, ahead of the May 2010 
the elections in the UK made a lot of noise about the UK could turn into Greece and there had to be fiscal austerity. And I spoke out against this, not so much because I disagreed with the assessment, which of course I did, but because I thought the central bank had no business talking that way about fiscal policy, particularly close to an election. And I sadly disagree with Jay Powell, uh, Federal Reserve Chair Jay Powell right now, talking so much about fiscal policy ahead of an election. I agree with him completely on substance, but I don't think it matters to the politicians. I don't think it's made any difference. And it just opens up the bank to attack. Now, again, this is not the first order issue, but just to say that I, I think going for a regime, an operating framework where the central bank isn't making constant comments about the appropriateness of fiscal policy. So I think another point about the reality that we face right now is for the academics in the audience, and this is a, is a point that I am still in opposition to many of my colleagues, including at Peterson and my friends, is that the time and consistency models of monetary policy that have been kicking around since the early 80s, Kidlin uh, Prescott, Marilyn Gordon, Rogoff et al., are completely irrelevant situation. But our present situation isn't just coronavirus, our present situation is for a very long time. So in my doctoral dissertation, which is now more than 25 years old, I, in an inadequate way, tried to take this on. And some of us writing about central bank independence at the time, including Alan Blinder, including the late Ben McCallum, were pointing out that central banks could just choose not to play that game. And the fact that there hasn't been an inflation bias that we've seen in central banks in decades, once we had the disinflation of the mid eighties, I think tells you that at a minimum, the time inconsistency argument was overdone. And then when you look at now, where the Bank of Japan, for example, has done everything since late 2012 that would supposedly erode their credibility of, of price stability commitment, including things that supposedly eroded central bank independence, and yet we've seen no leap up in inflation expectations. So I think that's part of the background in economic research we have to bring to this. So turning more practically to policy, which I know is all of our interest, I would, I would, the next reality I would key on is that monetary policy is much better at playing defense than offense. Uh, it's much better at preventing your opponent from scoring than from putting points on the board. In other words, if you have a panic in the financial markets, if you have a sharp deflationary or inflationary shock, if you have exit from the currency, if you have something abrupt like that and something that shows up in the form of financial illiquidity or spreads, central bank independence, excuse me, central bank monetary policy works. But as Keynes said about pushing on a string, and as we've seen repeatedly in, in Japan in, in recent years in the US and the Euro area, that the, um, excuse me, I'm sorry, that, that the, you can make interest rates as low as you like, you can create liquidity, but that does not lead to private sector investment. So again, it's Keynes pushing on a string. Um, so you, you have to accept that. And so this has two implications. One is again, the need of fiscal policy or other measures to get you the sustained recovery you want, but also the complete denial of this nonsense about central banks being out of ammo. It's a question of what's the problem. Were we to have another financial, uh, disruption as we had in March or April, the central banks would easily be able to deal with it. So it's not ammo generically about what you can and can't. This leads to another point, which I'm sure this audience does not need to hear, but since it is partly a, a German oriented conference, even though national, I feel the need to make it, that we should be getting rid of all notions of mechanistic monetarism from our discussion of monetary. Uh, I made this point in my first speech uh, as a member of the Bank of England Monetary Policy Committee in October 2009, and events since have even further borne this out. 
putting it in much too simple form, if you want to pick up on Milton Friedman's MV equals PQ, if you look at the last 20 years longer in Japan and elsewhere, but the last 20 years of policy in the US and the euro area, monetary aggregates have no meaning. All of the action is in the V. Everything is velocity. And velocity is determined by behavioral, structural, real factors that have nothing to do with monetary. And so it's just not a useful frame. So what then should we be doing going forward? Well, I think the most important thing, which the Fed has now under the leadership of Jay Powell and uh, Rich Clarida and Leo Brainerd announced, um, and which the ECB is making some noises towards announcing, is to not be preemptive uh, against inflation risks. The bias has been, along with the timing consistency literature, but even among very left considered um, moderate leaning central bankers like Janet Yellen and Alan Blinder on the US side, has been that you would always be preemptive about inflation. Uh, that you would always try to act before inflation got momentum, before inflation expectations got unanchored, and you would react on the basis of what you thought was the unemployment level that presented. And I think that this is a profoundly misguided approach, just based on the empirical realities that inflation is extremely sticky and there's no evidence of jumps in inflation expectations as well. And unfortunately in policy discussion. Um, and we saw this in the mid nineties in the US that um, Alan Greenspan, hardly a, a person concerned about employment, um, argued against preemptive interest rate hikes uh, because he wanted to see how the real economy would unfold and he wanted to see how what far you could go. Um, and Janet Yellen and Alan Blinder, who were serving on the Federal Reserve Board at that time, and I don't want to criticize them, they're intellectual heroes of mine, but the fact is, they were in favor. They pushed and occasionally voted for preemptive rate hikes because they viewed that as the right policy and the risk, and they were proven wrong. Um, and the Nobel laureate Robert Solo, in a much ignored piece by him, which is kind of funny since it's important, in a much ignored piece in him, uh, published, I believe, 1997 spoke about the idea of using monetary policy experimentally, seeing how low you could push unemployment before reacting. And again, I think the experience of the 20 plus years since 1997 was the back. Now you can get into a circular argument and say, well, but if you if people know you're not you're not going to preempt, know you're not committed to low inflation, then it'll jump up. Well, first doesn't seem to happen. But second, if that does happen, one can deal with it. Um, it's also, of course, important, as Jay Powell has been rightly emphasized, credit emphasized, and Janet Yellen also tried to, she was chair, that the distributional effects of business cycles are not neutral, that the impact on different groups, particularly in the US, but to some degree, as we're seeing with COVID and all advanced economies, tend to hit certain groups repeatedly worse than others with more persistent effects. And so it isn't very straightforward to just say, okay, we're gonna be preemptive because on balance, it looks risk adjusted, like we're giving up a little bit of unemployment versus inflation. The, the effects are profound. And I raised this question 20 plus years ago in an article I literally couldn't get published calling is fighting inflation a just war? Was it right to keep sending the unemployed, the same unemployed off again and again to be slaughtered on the inflation battlefield for the sake of the rest of the economy? Now, of course, if it's an existential threat, you draft people and you go to war, but you don't do wars of choice. And that's another way of analyzing. That. So again, to move to the more operational, I think a critical point to be made, not only that you shift away from preemptive approaches to inflation based, especially those based on unemployment, which again, I want to give the Federal Reserve Board, Chair Powell, Vice Chair Clarendon, a lot of credit because they move very far 
rhetorically and in commitment on this direction. Um, but that you replace your unemployment targets to the degree you have an employment target with labor force participation. And very broad labor force participation targets that take into account uh, measures of underemployment, as Danny Blanchflower has been pointing out. And that's the LFP from Mike. Um, back in 2014, Blanchflower and I published a paper in which we looked at state and local level, state level data in the US, excuse me, um, and established that people who were supposedly out of the workforce were actually putting downward pressure on wages. Consistent with this view. Uh, Jan Hatzius and his team at Goldman Sachs using different data around the same time came up with result. Michael Kiley, who's a researcher at the Federal Board, using again metropolitan level data, different data, got roughly the same result around the same time. There was something in the air. We were all out there saying labor force participation should not be assumed to be unable to rise the way some of the Fed employees who published said it would, said it couldn't, excuse me. And that that was a better target if you were going to have a labor target for monetary policy. And subsequent events bore that out, where, of course, labor force participation went up and unemployment as measured went down to levels never or thought as possible in the present situation in the US, but also, of course, in Germany and also, of course, in Japan. And so as various people, including those associated with the with the IMK, and others who I know are participating in this conference have argued, it probably central banks were underestimating the amount of effective labor markets and underestimating the ability of people to re-enter the work repeatedly. And so policy had a major bias downwards towards too tight. So that leads to the next point, uh, which makes me a bit more of a 1970s throwback. Um, again, maybe with the Boko Shiftung, I, that's being good, I don't know. But, you know, basically you cannot have inf sustained serious inflation economy on absent sustained wage growth. Now, I shouldn't say cannot, because I'm sure we can all come up with one or two examples. Um, and you can come up with economies that had leaps of inflation when at recent past hyperinflation, so that remains that muscle memory as it were. But if you look at the panel data, it is very difficult. The wage Phillips curve, but the wage has been very low. Wage growth is. And so, again, this gravitates towards the more reactive stance of monetary policy. Um, so let me try to put this together, the LFP and the YCC, the focus on labor force participation, and yield curve control, and how that takes us into where the central banks should be, where particularly the Fed and the ECB should be, 5, 10, 15 years. Um, let me start with the fact that IT, inflation targeting, which I had some part in the original work on. Um, in my view, and if you read the Bernanke, Laubach, Michigan, Posen book, we talked about it, was always meant as a reaction to a specific set of circumstances. It wasn't necessarily to be the monetary regime all time. It was an adaptation to a world where there's a lot of political pressure on central banks to, to particularly the Fed, to go to extreme rules-based views. There were people like the UK falling out of exchange rate pegs and needing some anchor. There were countries like New Zealand and Canada that felt they had to lock in the credibility from their disinflations. And I would argue equally importantly, there was in the realm of Volcker and Greenspan, as well as people at the Bundesbank and others, too little transparency about such. And so in reaction to that situation, inflation targeting, of course, Lars Svensson and Carl Walsh and others, and Michael Woodford and Ben Bernanke and other brilliant people did models of why inflation 
but it should be seen instead that's an ex post rationalization that it was Australia and the UK and Canada and New Zealand and then others adopting this as an adaptation to the situation. And as I said in remarks a couple of years ago now at the RBA's uh, review conference, this is demonstrated, and Guy DeBell has made a similar point, um, this is demonstrated by the fact that Austria doesn't fit most of the criteria of an inflation target or other countries don't. And these small differences in bargaining approach or in information releases which the academics make a lot of big deal about, make very little difference. And so it's not about being a pure inflation term, it's about being more flexible than a rule, more transparent than you used to be. And so the reason I go through that is just to say it is entirely appropriate for us to reevaluate and rebase and adapt inflation targeting to the reality we have now. We shouldn't be afraid to throw that away or at least adapt it significantly. And so that's where I think the labor force participation and yield curve control. That your yield curve control in a period of massive fiscal expansion, unlikely to be massive fiscal contraction anytime soon, God willing, of very restrained monetary, excuse me, very restrained inflation expectations, at least, and very limited private sector desire for productive investment, this is an environment in which you might as well just try to target the five or probably better the 10-year interest rate on the government bond as the Bank of Japan has done for a few years. And as I mentioned earlier, this makes easy the fiscal monetization because at any point the central bank can say either raising the target interest rate for the yield curve or we're ceasing to do this. There is no ongoing commitment. Similarly, relating to what I said, this allows the central bank to merely take an opinion in terms of its facilitation of fiscal based on financial and macroeconomic conditions. It doesn't have to pass judgment, composition of fiscal policy in any explicit way, imputing to itself oversight of what elected officials do, which it has no business. Thirdly, it gives a great deal of certainty for the environment, uh, for the business investment environment, and also for the workers. Fourthly, it gives you something which you can target. A lot of talk always about central banks can do this, central banks can do that, and then on the other side, we have no amp. You can intervene to control the long bond and the government bond market. Now, when I was speaking last January at a panel at the American Economic Association on the topic, I made a big point, and again, it wasn't unique to me, now others have made a point, that it was sort of a shame and an irony that for the ECB, they couldn't follow the Bank of Japan line, even if the Fed eventually could, because there wasn't a euro area safe asset that they could play with. And this was a major issue. And so then you could try to jury rig something with a basket, with something with he go off of buns, whatever. But of course, now the camel's nose is under the tent and we are starting to issue a euro wide asset. My colleagues like Angel Day and Jake Kierkegaard are being far more optimistic than I am uh, about the prospects for massive expansion of this safe asset in the near term. Nonetheless, I think that this gives one a bit of a pricing base to imagine using to guide some kind of basket of purchases for yield curve control. And it gives a fig leaf that there is some kind of European wide, which is whatever that, that uh, limited issue bond is. And of course, that's not really accurate, but it gives you a mechanism. What about labor force participation? So you're doing yield curve control, but then you need to decide when you raise the interest. Well, and of course you can look at inflation expectations. Um, and maybe someday in the 
we would be back in an environment where inflation expectations were meaningful, uh, above zero and flexible, which they basically are not right now. Uh, instead, I would say that your intermediate target then should be labor force purchase. And the way you find out what the level of labor force participation that can be is in the spirit of what Bob Solo said 20 years ago is you push it rather than as low as you can go on unemployment, you push it as high as you can go on participation. And you assume that you can get participation back up to whatever it was in the last recession, real up before the last recession. This is what, and this is one of the ironies that people on the left including close colleagues of mine like Olivier Blanchard and Larry Summer, you know, and now Jay Powell at the Fed, speak about scarring and hysteresis, and I used to too, as one of the justifications for why you did aggressive policy. Well, the, the, the irony is actually people are more resilient think, than we thought. Um, that the evidence for labor market scarring and hysteresis is actually pretty weak. And especially when you look at the last 20, 30 years in the US and Europe and the other advanced economies. Um, and so in a sense, this is good news. Um, uh, it takes away some of the justification, supposedly, for activist monetary policy. But it gives you additional reason to think that you can be ambitious with your goals of how high you can retain labor force participation rather than assuming that every setback. So finally, linking it back to where our moderator started us, this is yet another reason to abandon the language of so-called un. Thought about this, been inveighing against for some time. It was a very limited period earliest in the U.S., later in other countries, in which central banks focused solely on the short end of the uh, yield curve and, and were dealing solely in prices. They were doing administrative measures and purchases and sales of assets, all kinds of markets throughout their history. So we should not look at this as aberrant. If anything, as we've seen again in the response to COVID, um, Central banks are going to have to get their hands messy, active in this. And so, therefore, it is really not about QE and not about the balance sheet. It's about these broader intermediate targets of yield curve control, labor force participation, and less focus on the means of what you're doing or the balance sheet. Thank you very much for inviting me to participate in this. I hope that was useful. Thanks a lot um, for this very interesting presentation. And I'm quite sure that there are going to be lots of questions and remarks. And this is also um, already a reminder for our participants. So when you have any questions, please um, post them in the chat function. Um, briefly, um, give us some um, clue what your question is going to be about. And also tell us um, to whom you want to address your question. We're going to collect them now. Um, so that we can sum up after our three presentations and have a joint discussion afterwards. Um, so I would like now immediately go to our second presentation, which has the title um, Central Bank Challenges and the Revision of the Monetary Framework. I think that fits perfectly to what we have just heard, and I'm very curious to learn more. Thank you. If I go ahead, then you have to right? Okay. Okay. Shall I try? Maybe. Oh, I will Hoping out, please. Good. Yeah. Thank you very much for inviting me to this conference. I enjoyed last year participating because it was such a wonderful uh, crowd of people. Um, and so a little bit missing this wonderful atmosphere that we had last year, but hopefully that's not the last uh, conference and, and we will go back to normal life next year. So my topic is, um, the strategy for the ECB, and I gave you a title, a true strategy for the ECB, because I will show you a little bit that, in my view, this, what the ECB called strategy uh, in the last 20 years is not is a kind of fake strategy because it's not really fulfilling the functions that a strategy, in my view, should provide uh, in for, for, for monetary policy. So 
it's it's interesting that uh, the new president Christine Lagarde at her very first press conference uh, made the statement that a comprehensive strategy uh, review is required and she said this review of the strategy needs to look at all and every issue will turn each and every stone and it will take its time but it will not take too much time well she said this before co uh, the covid crisis so maybe it will take a little bit more time but it shows the importance um, that she attaches to this strategic review and i think she's completely right because if you if you look at the perception of the ecb uh, among european citizens you can see that it has really lost trust uh, especially after the great financial crisis and then after uh, the, the euro crisis has regained a little bit of trust in the last few years, but nevertheless there is this loss of trust. And of course in the German debate it's especially obvious. Uh, I talked about this at last year's conference where um, Mario Draghi was, was presented as somebody who is sucking the savings uh, from, from German savers. And, and so I think it was really, it's really necessary. And I would also say the decision of the German Constitutional Court in, in May showed that smart people like these constitutional courts, who are not economists, but nevertheless very smart guys, in my view, they did really not understand what the ECB is doing. Otherwise, I cannot imagine uh, why, why they made this, this very strange uh, decision. So what is the strategy? What is the purpose of a strategy? And uh, the ECB on its website defines it very nicely. It's, it says it's a comprehensive framework within which decisions on the appropriate level of short-term rates are taken. I think this is exactly what it is about. And so I think a strategy can be compared to a heuristic. A simple rule that reduces the complexity of very difficult decision processes and maybe also compare it to a kind of navigating system that you have in your car that helps you to find your way through an unknown, uncertain, unknown territory. So we have some experience with such heuristics in monetary policy. Um, uh, Adam already uh, alluded to monetary targeting, which looks very nicely because it reduces the decision-making process to the comparison of the actual monetary growth rate to a target growth rate that is compatible with non-inflationary long-term growth. So wonderful, you only have to compare uh, actual monetary growth with the target rate and you know as a central bank what you have to do. Sounds great. And in a similar way, the Taylor rule also reduces decision making to a very simple calculus. You simply have to compare the actual short-term interest rate with an optimum rate and this optimum rate is calculated as a neutral rate plus minus or minus adjustments for an inflation gap and an output gap. Sounds great. Uh, unfortunately, the experience with these very simple navigation systems is not very uh, convincing. So if you look at the Taylor rule, um, and, and here uh, on, the, on this chart, you can see uh, a chart from the German Council of Economic Experts and uh, Volker Bieland is, is someone who really uh, attaches much importance to, to Taylor rules, but you can see the navigation system of Taylor rule would have indicated interest rate increases for the euro area already in, in, in 2014, and according to the Taylor rule, uh, it would have had an interest rate of to three to four, three to three point five percent in 1919. And yeah, in retrospect, you can see this simply ridiculous because. The good thing is, until COVID, inflation was 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 rather too low uh, than than too high, and also all the stories about the financial instability created by low interest rates, the ECB uh, turned out not to be true. And so, in retrospect, you can say, well, the optimal rate was not the Taylor rate; it was the zero interest rate chosen by the ECB. So, forget about the Taylor rule. And if you look at the M3 rule for Germany, a similar story can be made. So this is a very old chart from the Bundesbank's report 1994. And you can see the Bundesbank had, each year the Bundesbank had a corridor for M3 growth. And you can, and, and so they made it on an annual basis. And you can see that M3 did not 
uh, really liked this corridor. It jumped over it. The Bundesbank then adjusted its corridor and it was a complete mess. But at the same time, uh, the, the inflation in Germany was, 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 was about 2%. Growth was fine. So again, this is also a kind of navigation system that leads you into the, into the bushes. So, um, what is, what is the navigation system that the ECB pretends to have? What is the heuristic that the ECB pretends to have? And that's a so-called two-pillar strategy of the ECB. And this two-pillar strategy consists of an economic analysis pillar and a monetary analysis pillar. And both pillars together should give guidance to the governing council in its decisions to reach the primary objective of price stability. The question is now, where is the reduction in complexity that you expect from a strategy in this two-pillar analysis? And the answer is, these two pillars simply state the obvious, but they provide no reduction of complexity. Because if you look uh, how the ECB explains these pillars, it says the economic analysis assesses short-term to medium-term determinants of price developments. To do so, the ECB reviews inter alia developments in overall output demand and labor market conditions, bond price and the yield curve, a broad range of price and cost indicators, business and consumer service, fiscal policy and the balance of payments for the euro app. De facto, it says the ECB looks at everything. And of course, this is fine, uh, but it doesn't provide any guidance for decision making. Huh? So you can say, well, what else would you expect from a central bank that it makes a, an economic analysis looking at all relevant data? So pretending we have a strategy with such pillars is just fake. It's not a strategy. It's just an enumeration of all the things that might be relevant. The same applies to the monetary analysis, so-called second pillar of the ECB strategy. And ECB says it's a detailed analysis of monetary and credit developments with a view to assessing the implications for future inflation and economic growth. And again, using a broad set of tools and instruments that are continuously refined and expanded. Uh, the tools uh, include a comprehensive analysis of monetary aggregates and so on and so on. So again, just an enumeration. But it had one, one reduction of complexity, uh, complexity, this monetary pillar, and that was a reference value for the money stock M3. And this is kind of heritage from the Bundesbank, I would say, it's an unhappy heritage from the Bundesbank to the ECB, that the, that the ECB in the beginning defined a reference value for the growth rate of M3, which was 4.5%. And, but you could see that the money stock M3 was not really comfortable with this, with this target and, and there were huge deviations, which had the result that this monetary pillar, which was the first pillar in 1999, was removed as a second, was, was, uh, was, was made the second pillar and that the ECB stopped making any, any statistical um, comparisons with this re reference value. And, and monetary stock M3, so it was a complete failure. In fact, one could see it. I wrote a paper for the European Parliament in 1998 saying if M3 did not work uh, with the Bundesbank, it would be very unlikely if it works for the ECB. Of course, this was a perfect, very, very good uh, forecast, but it was also not so difficult. So what then can we do for the ECB? So if the ECB wants a strategy, needs a strategy, how can we develop a meaningful a strategy for, for the ECB. And here I come to a point that Adam has already addressed. So the question is why not try inflation targeting? What's wrong with inflation targeting? Would that not be a good idea, good idea for the ECB? And as you can see, uh, many, many countries have adopted it. Uh, Adam has also, also already mentioned some of these countries. And the question is what is the reduction of complexity that is provided by inflation targeting. And the answer is simple. Inflation targeting means you have your inflation target, a quantitative target for inflation, which you explain and derive, and you compare it constantly with the inflation forecast. And so that's a very extremely simple uh, heuristic. You have this forward-looking element of your inflation forecast, two years, five years ahead. And you compare it uh, with 
with, with your inflation target. And once, as soon as you see major deviations, you can see something's going wrong. Of course, this is not a panacea, but it helps to structure the debates, the discussions on monetary policy, and it would have avoided many strange debates we had on the ECB uh, monetary policy, especially in Germany. So, if one recommends deflation targeting to the ECB, the question is, would it be difficult for the ECB to introduce inflation target? And what I will argue now is the ECB is practicing already a implicit camouflage inflation targeting. And the only thing required now is the ECB has the courage of a coming out and say, yes, we are targeting inflation. And I will show you the elements. The ECB has an inflation target. Like, I think that's very important for, um, for inflation targeting. I think they don't call it inflation target, but it is one. And it's, it's clearly defined. It's HICP inflation below but close to 2% over the medium term and symmetric. And these are the three important elements. The symmetry is normally not so much in the, uh, in the head of, of, of people talking about the ECB's monetary policy. And, and the ECB has made the symmetry not too explicit. But Mario Draghi on a press conference on 10th March 2016 said, our mandate is defined as reaching an inflation rate which is close to 2%, but below 2% in the medium term. Now comes the important thing, which means that we will have to define the medium term in a way that if the inflation rate was for a long time below 2%, it will be above 2% for some time. The key point is that the governing council is symmetric in the definition of the objective of price stability. And as I said, this symmetry is, is sometimes not so um, obvious to, to all ECB observers, and the ECB also did not make it too obvious in its state. The interesting thing is now the Fed has now adjusted its inflation target, and that has received a lot of attention. And the interesting thing is that the new inflation target of the Fed looks like if it has been copied from this statement by Mario Draghi. Because what does Chairman Powell say? Our new statement indicates that we will seek to achieve inflation that averages 2% over time. Now comes almost the same wording. Therefore, following periods when inflation has been running below 2%, appropriate monetary policy will likely aim to achieve inflation moderately above 2% for some time. But it's very, very interesting because there was so much discussion on this Fed strategy and people obviously did not realize that the ECB, probably not in such a prominent way, has also already since, since several years the symmetry um, in, its, in its strategy. So I said inflation targeting means comparing inflation target with inflation forecast. What about the inflation forecast? Yes. the the ECB has an inflation forecast um, because they, what they, they produce what they call macroeconomic projections, and these projections are produced by the euro system and the ECB staff. And, and the lack of courage to, uh, to have an a, a explicit um, inflation targeting can be shown that the ECB is not talking about macroeconomic forecasts, they call it projection, uh, but it's a forecast. And then they say, well, these projections are not the projections of the governing council, they are the projections of the euro system and the ECB staff. But anyhow, so if you have a staff that produces projections or forecasts, which you do not share, which you do not uh, which you think they're, they're, they're inadequate, then you, you dismiss the relevant people in your staff. But so in principle, it is the inflation forecast of the ECB. And I think that's very useful. And the ECB uh, provides these projections, which are forecasts, on a quarterly basis. And I think what's really important is that the ECB makes a comparison of its own projections with the forecasts of all kinds of, of institutions. I think this provides an element of objectivity 
because as a central bank, if you deviate from the forecast of other forecasters, you are under the obligation to justify why you're, why you're, why you're different. And so I think that's a very important element of inflation targeting, that these forecasts have to be made in a kind of objective way by the central bank, so it cannot be used for some kind of, of uh, inconsistent policies or some kind of cheating of, of the public. So the ECB has both inflation um, target, inflation forecasts, and so if you look now at these inflation forecasts over a longer period of time, and I have here the data by the survey of economic forecasters, you can nicely see um, how one would have, or how, how to assess the ECB's policy. If you especially look at the period, let's say from 2014 until today, you can see that the forecasts for five years ahead and for two years ahead were consistently below the 2%. So the whole debate in Germany that the ECB's policy is inflationary and, and not stability or in, and, and whatever, um, all the, in all these years you could have seen where the inflation forecasts and they are below. And this forecast, survey of economic forecasters are professional research institutions. And so if you as an ECB critic are not satisfied with the ECB's policy, you should then have the courage to say, okay, I don't agree with these uh, forecasts by the survey of economic forecasters. I, my forecast is a higher inflation rate. Huh? But by not making this inflation uh, targeting system explicit, all these, all these the, the German ECB critics could say, well, we think that the ECB policy is inadequate and they, it creates all kinds of inflation tensions. Um, but they were not forced to say, okay, if you have the feeling that the ECB's policy is wrong, please make your own forecast and then show, give a, give a clear figure, and then ex post we can, can see what, what, what's wrong. And so I think that's the important advantage of explicit inflation targeting that it forces critics to make their own forecast, not just mumble that something is not stability oriented and so on. So I think that would really help to structure the discussion on, on monetary policy. So then I will come almost to the end. So what would be a better strategy? I would say forget the two pillars that are nothing but an empty shell, which does not mean that one should should give up watching monetary and credit aggregates. So of course, credit and monetary growth has to be watched, monitored closely, but and I think that's a difference to the two-pillar strategy, not as a leading indicator for inflation, but for financial instability. In fact, when the ECB uh, started to, to, to give less and less importance to the monetary pillar, they did it because they saw, well, a lot of monetary growth, but no inflation. But that was the wrong assignment. They should have realized monetary growth is important and excessive monetary growth is dangerous, but not in first instance for inflation, but for the stability of the financial system. Okay, then I would say transform the implicit inflation targeting into explicit inflation targeting, which means clarify the symmetry of the medium term inflation target, substitute the awkward below but close to 2%, by simply 2%, rename inflation projection in inflation target. And I think that would be a relatively simple uh, procedure, which would, in my view, also, also it's, it's not, it's more nuances, it's more the marketing, but it would really help to give the debate on on the ECB policy a kind of objective basis and, and it would make it easier for the ECB also to deal with unfounded criticisms by people who simply don't like like the ECB. Okay, some short, very, very short remark on a green strategy. I think that's also something that has been discussed um, and, and will be, I think, uh, an important role in the debate on the strategic review. Uh, Clemens Fust some uh, days ago said, the ECB should not steer capital flows. Greening monetary policy leads to ineffic inefficient capital allocation. It is also a violation of the ECB's mandate and deeply undemocratic. And uh, I 
reacted on Twitter and said, I cannot sh share this view because uh, the mandate of the ECB, Article 127 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union, of course, says price stability is the primary objective, but it says without prejudice to the objective of price stability, the ECB shall support the general economic policies in the Union with a view, as laid down in Article 3 of the Treaty of the European Union, contributing to the achievement of the objectives of the Union. And now going to Article 3 of the Treaty on the European Union, it says the, U, uh, says, um, the, U, the Union shall work for the sustainable development of Europe based on a high level of protection and improvement of the quality of the environment. So I must say I don't see by a greening in the strategy is violating the mandate and I don't see, also don't see that it is undemocratic because the decision to give this man this mandate to the ECB is was a democratic decision and so I really cannot cannot understand why uh, Cayman's Fuss came to this um, conclusion. Nevertheless, I think one should also not too much take too much from uh, the ECB in the field of climate policy. I think you have the primary object, objective of price stability and, and if one derives from this uh, primary, primary objective, um, how many government bonds the ECB can purchase. So the volume of the government bonds is, is more or less predetermined and for government purchases, I think there is no would be the purchase of government bonds. There would be no specific green dimension. So, what the ECB can do, it can privilege green companies when it is about the collateral for the refinancing of bank and also in its corporate bond purchases. I think there is something the ECB can do. But I think one should be clear: climate policy will remain the main responsibility of national governments and the European Union. And in my view the ECB can only play a secondary role. Okay, so far, um, maybe one uh, word to the yield curve control that Adam uh, has proposed. I think yield curve control is not a contradiction to inflation targeting because inflation targeting is concerned about the final objectives of monetary policy and yield curve control is, is just an instrumental approach to achieve this final um, the final target uh, of, of price stability. And I have a lot of sympathy for yield curve control. In fact, I have already in, in minority vote, of course, uh, for the council report in two or three years. I said yield curve control, as it is practiced in, in Japan, is, is a very good instrument. And, and uh, I, I see no reason why one should not use it. Uh, and therefore, I fully agree with Adam's uh, proposal. I also find it nice that Adam uh, is criticizing uh, the time inconsistency models uh, as irrelevant. That's what I, what I uh, also and I, when I was, was, was discussing uh, these models in the 1980s. That's what was also my perception from the very beginning. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks a lot for your presentation and uh, the insights into a new strategy for the ECB. Um, before we start our general discussion, we of course have now our um, second panelist, which is now in the third in the row, um, to make sure that um, we also have uh, collected all the questions just again for our participants. Please, when you want to pose a question, please write it um, in the chat um, and tell us um, whom you want to address with that question, just with um, very brief um, some keywords so that we know how to cluster them after our third presentation. Um, now, the floor is yours. Um, thank you for having me again this year on this uh, conference. And uh, as you see, I have a long outline, uh, so I will try to be uh, very brief, going more through uh, statements than uh, demonstrations or justifications. I try to follow the um, theme of our session by starting to ask uh, what uncharted waters uh, are you referring to? Uh, 
And I came up with three possible uh, scenarios that would contain an element of uncharted uh, waters for both the central banks. And, and the first one is very simple because it's mostly a prolongation of what we have been having for many years, which is the uh, failure of uh, attaining the uh, target uh, for inflation. Um, and uh, that, of course, is in a way already an uncharted water because central banks were given independence many years ago, mostly to tackle high inflation and to restrict the economy uh, in order to reduce the high inflation, which they did. And of course, uh, that's not a very popular thing to do because normally the restriction of the economy implies recessions uh, and uh, uh, it's not popular. And uh, although fiscal policy could perhaps also do it through uh, reducing the deficits, increasing taxation and all of that, uh, it is, of course, uh, uh, historical true, and if we think about our democracies and the way they, they have to work, uh, to expect that governments and parliaments would come up with the proper fiscal policy tightening the economy in time. So that was given to uh, uh, institutions uh, uh, led by technocrats that were given that uh, mandate. But then in the last 30 years, uh, inflation has been quite moderate and on the low side, uh, especially after the 2008 crisis. Uh, and that's in a way uncharted uh, for, for the uh, central banks. Uh, and indeed they have failed to achieve the 2% uh, target in the case of the uh, uh, ECB. And also in the case of the Fed, inflation since 08 has been uh, uh, for a long time below two, although they did uh, perhaps a slightly better job. But I'd like to look to this uh, uh, chart uh, that I took from the FT uh, that shows in the red lines inflation for the US measured in terms of core PCE inflation, which is a, a metric that the Fed likes, uh, uh, the red line from uh, uh, 65 to 88, in the case of the euro area inflation, from 77 to 95, and then uh, in blue, what came after that. And I draw your attention to a few uh, facts in those charts. First, uh, looking uh, to the uh, left, we see that the peaks of inflation were uh, oil shocks in 74, 79, and then the Gulf War in the early 90s, and so were related to oil prices, not really with, uh, you know, monetary aggregates. And then, this inflation happened immediately after, uh, engineered by, by the central banks indeed, because that's uh, why they have independence to do it. But uh, it's important to underline that in all those cases, there were also recession. And also the, the nice world of rational expectations where a very harsh but announced and credible policy will have no costs in terms of uh, output. It's not true, of course, uh, and that was accompanied, of course, by, by um, recessions because it has to do with restricting the economy. And if it would be fiscal policy doing it, uh, the effect would be also on the recessionary side. So one has to be aware uh, of that. Um, and uh, uh, the other point I wanted to underline in this chart, looking to the blue lines, uh, and even a little before, um, uh, we see that inflation has been around 2% and then mostly below uh, after 2008, showing that there is a lot of inertia in inflation which of course impacts expectations about inflation after so many years of moderate uh, inflation. And that makes it difficult 
to break the mold and to have an engineer uh, inflation uh, at 2% or uh, around, really around it, and when asked to uh, do, to have that into consideration. One aspect I already mentioned is that, of course, uh, um, inflation was not a, a monetary phenomenon always and everywhere, as uh, uh, Friedman uh, pretended, um, and that indeed uh, this period shows that uh, uh, that view of inflation uh, cannot be uh, sustained. Monetarism is mostly uh, dead for most uh, economists uh, for quite a while, and this experiment is uh, quite clear. Of course, we know that in very high inflations, in hyperinflations, there must be a co-movement with money to, uh, you know, just uh, uh, allow the transactions uh, to take place. Uh, so there is co-movement uh, with money, whatever you count as money, uh, but that's co-movement. That's not necessarily causality, and we know from history that those hyperinflations are very much uh, related to uh, uh, fiscal indiscipline and uh, uh, rogue states that have no uh, real institutions. So here you see uh, how the uh, ECB balance sheet and QE led to much subsided increase in M3 monetary aggregate, and inflation is down there. And uh, uh, you have also the numbers for the whole period in the table uh, below. The problem is that the mantra of Friedman that uh, inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon conquered many people in public opinion and even uh, uh, several central bankers that uh, uh, started to believe because it flatters central banks, of course, that they have such power, uh, started to believe that they can move inflation down or up. It's much easier to move it down than uh, than uh, up, uh, as history demonstrates in many episodes, uh, but they also uh, uh, were convinced that uh, they, they could do it. And uh, that's where we have been, and this element of uncharted waters uh, uh, really uh, has the risk that there will be pressures that the central banks may perhaps uh, uh, then yield to to uh, do more and more of the same uh, in order to prove that indeed uh, the central bank controls inflation and can put inflation at whatever level uh, um, uh, it uh, wants it to be, uh, albeit uh, in a few years. And that's clearly not true, as we see from this uh, these evidence. Uh, and. Uh, because continuing to do uh, most of the same uh, reflect, for instance, that if we look to market interest rates, they are very, very low uh, indeed. Uh, if you look to sovereign uh, bonds that provide a benchmark for uh, private bonds, you have Germany with minus uh, 0 0.6 10 uh, year uh, bonds, you have Italy at 0 0.75. You have uh, uh, Spain at 0 0.18, Portugal at 0 0.16, uh, Greece at 1%. These are the figures for today. And how much lower can this go? And what will be the effect on decisions on consumption and investment that can impact really the uh, real economy and make a difference to the pressure of uh, demand over supply in order to have higher inflation? So it's evident and explainable, uh, Adam, that uh, central banks are talking uh, more and more about fiscal policy because, particularly after COVID, uh, fiscal policy it's the policy that can move um, the real economy because it really engineers income transfers and makes real expenditures uh, whereas central banks can create incentives by very low uh, interest rates, and they are already very low, and the real expenditure side doesn't respond the way it is supposed to, uh, to respond. So that's the first element, and I think by what I just said, 
that central banks uh, run a risk uh, of continuing to push on a string, uh, to use the Keynes expression, and that's not a good policy uh, necessarily. So uh, we have to understand and acknowledge what is going on. The second element of uncharted water has to do with financial instability, because twice in 10 years, central banks add to uh, uh, provide huge liquidity to institutions and markets in order to uh, avoid a collapse uh, of the financial system. So it had to be done. Uh, but the degree uh, of what had to be done this time uh, is also a reflection of the excesses of the sector itself. And by repeating this operation, uh, the uh, um, central banks really empower the uh, financial exuberance of the financial sector uh, in a way that can create uh, down the road uh, uh, additional instability because it gives a sort of policy put, a guarantee that the uh, asset valuations when they come down after a boom period can be and would be protected by central bank uh, uh, liquidity all the time. And this creates, of course, huge moral hazard, uh, uh, empowers the financial sector by having, uh, by being saved all the time of uh, bigger losses by these uh, public uh, interventions, and this cannot go on. And uh, uh, monetary policy uh, cannot really transform itself into a sort of guarantee of a financial condition index that has several asset prices there uh, and transform this financial condition uh, index in a sort of intermediate target of monetary policy, uh, which is a risk. Because when we see, for instance, that in 2018, the Fed was trying to increase rates and normalize policy, and then there was a downturn in the stock market in uh, late uh, 2018, and immediately after, the uh, Fed made a spectacular U-turn in policy uh, and uh, gave up any further increases and talked then about uh, expansionary uh, monetary policy. So this is also uncharted water because the uh, uh, taming of the financial sector can only be done by regulation uh, and macroprudential policies and not by monetary policy. But then it would be expected, of course, that the central banks would be there if there would be, again, a very stressful situation down the road. So something has to be done about this. Then we may come up with catastrophic uh, scenarios uh, that um, you know, old guard uh, uh, persons come up with uh, uh, every week. Uh, and they involve the idea that out of these... Uh, events that are now ongoing, there will be high inflation coming, uh, it's a matter of time, uh, high inflation will come, and that will create a big problem of the debt trap, because everyone, plus both the public sector and the private sector, will come out of the COVID crisis with much higher uh, debt, and if high inflation comes, central banks would have to increase uh, interest rates, and then that would provoke uh, bankruptcies in the private sector, defaults, and uh, in the public sector, explosion of, of the debt uh, or uh, very high and difficult primary circles would have to be immediately created uh, with recessionary consequences. And so the narrative goes that in that case, of course, governments will not allow central banks to increase rates when inflation comes and will change laws and we'll take over the printing press, and uh, we are then in a very dangerous world. And that's the narrative that uh, would be also a totally uh, uh, uncharted water for central banks. I don't believe this uh, 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 will happen, uh, both of the two elements of this uh, uh, narrative. Although that is not to say that the uh, sovereign debt uh, problem uh, will be with us, for uh, many, many years to come, uh, because we are now in advanced economies at another peak, like uh, uh, after the Second World War. Um, and 
what allowed, after both wars, the reduction of uh, uh, public debt in relation to GDP are not available uh, methods now. There will not be very buoyant high growth. There will not be a degree of inflation that will help uh, absorbing the uh, uh, high uh, debt. Um, also, uh, there will not be in the same way, in principle, financial repression, because after the Second World War, indeed, central banks, even those who that formerly had independence, uh, embarked into a degree of financial repression, keeping interest rates below inflation for a while, at least the mid 50s uh, in the US. Uh, this time it will be more difficult to do that. Uh, restructurings are also uh, not uh, a, uh, an issue for the really advanced uh, economies. Austerity, big austerity, uh, will also be counterproductive is if it comes very early because it will. Uh, create immediate recession and the debt ratio can even uh, increase as the experience of Japan with tax increases in 2014 and 19 uh, demonstrates. So all the elements for reducing easily the debt are not there. So we are facing decades of roll over the debt with a very, very gradual uh, reduction over uh, these uh, decades by having small primary circles. Uh, and if that will be possible, keeping uh, uh, interest rates on the uh, low side, even if they can uh, uh, at a certain moment go above the growth of GDP. Uh, but with a small uh, um, primary circles, the situation can be manageable. Uh, in that case, only if, of course, high inflation is not coming. And that's on what everything hinges in these uh, uh, scenarios. So let me turn to the uh, more likely medium term scenario. I don't dare go beyond six years uh, in making some uh, uh, sort of predictions. I think in that time span, uh, uh, we will not have high inflation. The uh, high theories of uh, inflation using uh, uh, stylized small models and uh, 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 taking steady states of these very stylized models, like in the theory, in the, the so called fiscal theory of the price level, which is uh, uh, very wrong, uh, by the way, but uh, uh, we also uh, just saw that uh, monetarism doesn't work. So uh, all these grand theories of inflation in, indeed don't uh, apply now. And the, uh, what applies is then the notion that a view of inflation is provided by uh, looking into the conditions of aggregate demand and aggregate supply. And both elements play a role uh, in uh, uh, inflation pressure that can put up uh, prices. There was a time during which the uh, uh, indicator of output gap or un unemployment gap, uh, I mean the slack in the economy, could be a proxy of the overall gap between aggregate uh, demand and aggregate supply, but no longer because that does not capture, uh, for instance, the elements that come from inertia, from the formation of expectations, and from supply and cost shocks that are not really captured, but represent a shift to the left of the supply curve of the uh, economy. And I'm referring to markups. I'm referring to uh, wage shocks like in uh, 68, in the late 60s, uh, uh, in Europe uh, in particular, uh, but also a bit uh, in, uh, in the US, or and especially import prices and commodity prices that are important like oil, and we saw that in their chart in the past, inflation was high when we had oil shocks of different uh, uh, origin. Um, so it means that we do have an operational way of looking to, to inflation and predict it, which is by taking a multivariable approach that includes inertia, past inflation, includes expectations, 
And as Gorodnyshenko and Kouivion have shown, it works better with taking expectation from uh, actual service uh, than, uh, you know, using some model and taking rational expectations. Uh, and then adding, of course, uh, some measure of slack of the economy and then import prices, uh, particularly commodity prices. And this sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, reduced form model, uh, which is called also by many as a uh, uh, Phillips curve, which creates the confusion that the origin, original Phillips curve was just, was just a bivariate uh, 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 regression, it doesn't work anymore. But if you put the slack with the other variables, the thing works well. So if you look to the future, what do we see? Uh, what can be the elements of uh, potential uh, uh, high inflation that some uh, economists see in the horizon? Well, I don't see it because I'm not expecting in this scenario of a big deflationary shock that we are still uh, ongoing. I don't see oil uh, uh, doing the jump, uh, a spike uh, or other commodities. And if we look to uh, elements of demand, we see that consumption will be affected by uh, the uh, unemployment that exists, by the increase in inequality that happened during the COVID uh, crisis, uh, and also by precautionary savings, because after a major, a major uh, shock, a major crisis, it has happened all the time, including after 2008, that uh, uh, saving, the savings rate goes up. Uh, precautionary uh, savings have a jump. So we cannot expect very buoyant uh, private consumption. We also cannot expect very buoyant uh, uh, investment, business investment. It's not happening. And uh, the idea that the cost of capital or the cost of finance would be a driving element to uh, really uh, make uh, private investment uh, uh, jump start is not working um, uh, because uh, you know uh, many many years ago uh, Blanchard and Summers uh, in 93 I guess uh, proved that the idea that interest rates or Tobin's Q which takes capitalization of firms in uh, in the stock exchange uh, would be good explanations of investment and they came up with uh, uh, having sales and therefore demand and profits as better uh, variables to explain uh, investment behavior. And that's what we are seeing. And so uh, if uh, consumption and also international trade will decelerate, there is no reason to expect immediately high inflation, uh, high investment. And so we are left now with fiscal policy that will continue, but after 22, 23, there will be, of course, a natural reduction in public expenditure uh, because we will be uh, uh, beyond COVID uh, by then, uh, and that will happen for uh, several reasons. Let's hope that meanwhile, um, the private sector uh, expenditure can become a little more buoyant, but there are no conditions for a, a high inflation looking looking forward and so the uh, catastrophic scenarios that we also can read um, uh, are not going to uh, to materialize uh, in uh, in my view there is another um, uh, narrative which takes a, a longer term view which uh, came from uh, goodhart uh, in the book that he just published uh, where he sees that Demography is changing, uh, populations in advanced economies are uh, declining already, and there won't be a new China, a new India, uh, new Asian countries coming up to increase the labor supply in the world economy. That will not be repeated, so we will have a, a, a relative shortage of labor that will put up uh, wages and inflation. Well. It's well into the future. Uh, I won't dwell on it, uh, and I don't share completely the conclusions because I believe that technology uh, with robotization, uh, 
uh, and so on, will allow an adjustment uh, in the long term to this uh, to this situation. So this scenario uh, is also uh, perhaps not very likely. So uh, I conclude uh, saying that we are uh, facing a sluggish recovery in a scarred economy by capital and labor hysteresis. Uh, there will be possibly some price spikes uh, as a result of uh, pent up demand that uh, suddenly materializes and supply has been uh, uh, damaged by bankruptcies and by uh, damaged uh, international supply chains. So there may be price strikes, but that's not a sustained process of uh, inflation. So what we need is macro policies, both monetary and fiscal, in expansionary mode for a high pressure economy to uh, really take care of those uh, scars. And the more important policies uh, going forward in this perspective are, of course, fiscal policy, regulation and supply side industrial policies for a green project, more so than uh, monetary policy for the reasons already implicit uh, on what I said. Very briefly, before going to the uh, revision of monetary frameworks, uh, just uh, two minutes on this slide because I wanted, but I won't, I don't have time to provide some background or reflect on some background features of our economic regimes that uh, uh, create uh, uh, problems and pressures on monetary policy. Well, the first is, of course, the failure to attain inflation and the death of uh, monetarism and also of the mantra that inflation is always and everywhere a monetary uh, phenomenon, uh, so that has been dealt with. But the other elements are financialization of our economies and the emergence of a financial cycle with real e economy effects. And that's a new thing that uh, became evident uh, after the 2008 uh, crisis. Uh, and this financial cycle, according to some economists, even uh, threatens to dominate the economic cycle and be the more uh, important element to explain it. Uh, and financial sector excesses and instability that monetary policy cannot control because monetary policy cannot de deal in normal times with the asset prices. Yes, monetary policy in moments of acute stress saves the day. Uh, and that's why, uh, you know, uh, central banks became famous uh, and as masters of the universe, uh, both in 2008 and now, uh, because they provided all the liquidity and the support, which is, uh, in a way, requires some boldness, but it's, in a way, an easy task to do. It's more difficult to push up inflation uh, when inflation has been on the low side for decades now. Uh, but, indeed, in normal times, I don't see monetary policy as uh, efficiently targeting asset prices or financial condition indexes, and because that requires regulation and macroprudential policies. The other element is secular stagnation, which provides an overall background of all our discussions. Advanced economies are going through a real period of deceleration of growth and productivity, um, uh, which then is associated with low inflation and low equilibrium interest rates. And the causes are both from as uh, Summers uh, has uh, uh, underlined from structural demand deficiency due to inequality, demography, and so on, but also from a deceleration of productivity growth due to lack of significant innovations with sufficient economic traction. And that's the element that is important. There, is, there are many innovations, but not with big economic traction in creation of jobs and incomes. So we need, again, for fiscal and structural, because, again, monetary policy cannot deal with that. And also, we now uh, have finally uh, uh, a renewed consensus um, that even for stabilization of our economies, it's not just uh, monetary policy that uh, must do it and is able to do it, but that we need also active uh, fiscal policy for that purpose. Uh, whereas the uh, conventional 
consensus about the policy mix that has prevailed for decades uh, said that uh, monetary policy does stabilization and fiscal policy uh, in terms of macro perspective should manage uh, and control public debt and nothing else and then have microeconomic uh, goals in terms of the effects of uh, the taxes and expenditures that it does. But that has fortunately also changed. So in this, in, in this environment, what can we say about the new monetary policy framework, uh, thinking more about the ECB? Well, to the point of Peter, uh, I agree with him. Uh, I, I made a speech uh, uh, in May of 2018, just before leaving uh, uh, the ECB, uh, demonstrating uh, point by point that what the ECB has been doing basically uh, after 2003 uh, became more and more an inflation target uh, regime. Uh, indeed, because the revision of the framework in 2003 already demoted significantly the monetary pillar, you never uh, heard again about the reference value uh, of four and a half percent that was totally uh, disregarded uh, after uh, May 2003 and what we had uh, with the publication of uh, uh, forecasts uh, for inflation, although uh, albeit staff forecasts, uh, was the main features of a, um, a flexible uh, inflation targeting uh, regime. So what we need this time, in my view, is some sort of what the Fed just uh, did, uh, meaning that uh, facing the period of failing to achieve the target, uh, there is the risk that uh, uh, inflation expectations, which uh, have been well anchored uh, anyhow around uh, uh, 2% uh, medium and long term, uh, may indeed uh, uh, unanchor to much lower level, and that's a risk uh, in view of the uh, justification, the good justification for, for, for the objective of 2% uh, or even slightly above uh, for uh, good reasons, um, uh, we need to re-enhance enhance the commitment of central banks to uh, that target. Um, just defining a, a, a higher target would not be credible uh, now, uh, going for price level targeting also it's uh, very difficult to explain or going for nominal GDP targeting is uh, not practical. Uh, and so uh, uh, going for a sort of a, a mini price level thing uh, via a average inflation target, which is flexible because no definition of the period for averaging is uh, uh, announced or committed to, it's a way of enhancing that commitment because in practice, what it means, as Adam said, is that there will not be preemptive strikes of increasing rates when the uh, slack in the economy starts to be, uh, become uh, very small um, and starting to increase rates before inflation has materialized. That will not happen again. Uh, and so uh, inflation will be um, allowed to go above for several years. And I say allowed because in view of the uh, um, sort of instruments that the central banks have, they cannot really say that they will manage to increase uh, inflation above target for a certain number of years because they don't have perhaps now the instruments to ensure that, but they can condone if it goes up. Uh, and that in itself is a change in policy. It's also important to consider that this absence of any preemptive strikes uh, against uh, inflation means that if inflation indeed goes above 2% and interest rates are not changed uh, because of the averaging, that all the rest being equal, uh, as we like uh, to say, uh, 
uh, even in Latin, um, all the rest being equal, that favors also a, a, a policy of a weaker currency and a, a weaker dollar in that case. So for all these set of reasons, I think major uh, central banks will follow the Fed in these, uh, perhaps in uh, slightly different forms, but it is unavoidable that it has to be followed for, uh, for those reasons. So keeping the 2% or the defining the 2% clearly, but uh, on, uh, on average with the effects that I uh, just mentioned. In the case of the ECB, it would be important if there would be in the new framework an explicit recognition of a mandate to ensure homogeneous, uh, to ensure that transmission of monetary policy is as homogeneous as possible across member states. It has been said recently after the COVID crisis, yes, that uh, avoiding fragmentation is uh, a goal, but that is linked to a a responsibility of the, the uh, uh, euro system to do it, uh, be doomed as a responsibility of uh, the uh, uh, euro system to do it. The first doubts about uh, this uh, issue of uh, uh, possible financial fragmentation in the euro area. Uh, we know that from the start, one of the vulnerabilities of a monetary union uh, among different uh, uh, states is the vulnerability of some national sovereign debt markets that can be easily targeted and attacked uh, because the countries no longer have their own currency and central bank. And that happened in a way, there was contagion uh, in the crisis uh, of the past. And in 2005, before those crises, a decision was taken to define a minimum rating given by rating agencies to sovereign debt in order for sovereign debt to be accepted as collateral for monetary policy operation. Uh, and at the time, it was until 2005, it was assumed that the monetary union among sovereign states, the uh, debt those states would be accepted, perhaps uh, with their, and there were haircuts already at that time, but there was this uh, uh, prohibition. Um, and then it has to be, uh, initially it was A minus, then the crisis came, it became BBB, and then uh, also exception to if there would be a program, but it would be a time to reconsider that decision to sign to signal that there is indeed this commitment. Yeah, I have to, uh, to end. Uh, you can read the rest of the points I had there. Uh, the discussion about helicopter money or other things like that, uh, as uh, 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 Carl Wellen in the previous panel already explained, is not possible according to the treaty. So we are left with the elements we have. Yield curve control cannot be done in the same way as uh, in Japan or other countries because there is, as Adam said, no uh, um, uh, European safe asset. The only thing that can be done and, and could be done at a certain point in time when the uh, uh, self-imposed limits of purchases will, uh, uh, will uh, bite is to say that further purchases will be concentrated on 10-year bonds without providing, of course, any targets for the 19, uh, for the 19 uh, sovereign bonds. Um, uh, I would like to talk about the floor system uh, of monetary policy implementation, an important flexible element, and also the dual uh, uh, rate system, but I will give that uh, uh, as the final thoughts in this uh, slide. So to sum up uh, in, in one sentence, new commitment to uh, the targets are uh, necessary, but it's also necessary that central banks avoid the hubris of their own mythology and accept the idea 
that uh, they cannot do uh, everything and that our economies are facing structural problems that cannot be addressed just by monetary policy. Thank you. Thanks a lot to our panelists and thanks a lot for your um, enlightening presentations. We collected already uh, some questions and there might be also more questions now um, in the pipeline summary. But um, I would like um, to start with um, a question that we collected from our live stream. So this means that um, our live stream uh, participants cannot directly post the questions, but I'm going to read them. And uh, this question is from Tarek Ahambal and it's directed to Professor Bopinger. And um, he asks, uh, why exactly is it the motivation for the ECB to keep the inflation low when unemployment is on a hike? Well, I would say the good thing with inflation targeting is if you have demand shocks, if you have insufficient demand, there is no trade-off between unemployment and, and inflation target. So I think that's... People often say it's a trade-off, but if you look in the current situation, we see that inflation is not definitively below the inflation target. The inflation forecasts have, have been revised downwards. And so if the central banks now try to keep get inflation back to 2%, it's the same thing as, as trying to get um, uh, unemployment down. So I think that's really important that in the case of demand shock, there's no trade-off between the inflation target and employment. Okay, and I think we could maybe a little later come back to the question if um, uh, inflation targeting then is the strategy that we um, should put forward as there are many, um, also many critiques towards um, inflation targeting. But uh, we also have a question um, that um, is posed by Hans-Jörg Herr um, to the presenters. I would like now to give him the floor. And um, the question that he uh, poses in general is about um, the labor costs and the relation to the price level. Um, should I ask my question? Yes, please. Okay, so thank you for this uh, nice presentation. It's very, very nice. Um, I'm, my, my question is, uh, especially if you follow uh, Keynes' treatise on money, then it's quite clear that unit labor costs play a key role in uh, development of the price level. And we spoke about asymmetric power of central banks. In, in my judgment, there is a danger that the next years, for, especially in Europe, um, wage increases may be very, very low, or even we may have, if unemployment goes up, uh, wage cuts. And then there's a danger that we have a kind of Japanese scenario of long-term situation of uh, nominal unit labor costs not going up, but slightly going down. My, my question is, is this analysis shared? If it is the case, the European Central Bank should demand higher wages, so they should actively uh, uh, look for for a partner also in the labor market for, for unions to increase wages sufficiently. Thank you. We don't have, um, we don't hear you, Professor Bopinger. I view this is a more likely scenario than a high inflation scenario, so I completely share Hans-Jörg's view. Uh, the question is only how to deal with it, and of course it depends on the timing. So if you right now say we want to have strong wage increases, um, it's probably not the right time, but once you see that the situation has stabilized, that the output gaps have been closed, I think then of course it's, I think central banks should also talk to the to, to labor unions and and try to do it together. Yeah, but some kind of it would be some kind of income policy. 
but it must come at the right time, not now. <laughs> Um, is that um, already answering your question, or is there anything you want to put a little bit again? No, um, no, that, that, that's fine. So I think it's uh, yeah. I'm obviously uh, we agree, yeah, Mr. Peter and myself. Yeah. <laughs> I agree too. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, actually, I would um, also like to pose um, a question because we are running out of time, actually. Um, and my question would um, be addressed to both of you because you both tackled a little bit um, the question of heterogeneity in the system. And this also connects to the question how our the yield curve um, is connected to that. Uh, when we talk about um, yield curve control um, and the possibilities that we have seen in Japan, my question for the Eurozone would be, um, is that now um, not kind of an asymmetric relation because um, which uh, bonds would be tackled uh, with um, the yield curve control? Would it be then now implied that we need something like euro bonds in there? Or um, we should we go for um, the ones with the highest spread to Germany or should we address Germany? So please, can you both maybe give me an insight on that? Yeah, uh, well, I, come, I go first this time. Uh, if you don't mind, uh, well, yield curve control, as the Bank of Japan has done it, is to say, well, the more important uh, benchmark uh, sovereign rate is the medium term rate, say 10 years. So they have a sort of target for that rate uh, and then do purchases in the market in order to steer that rate to that level. So they concentrate the purchases on, on that. And by hinting or even explicitly saying what is the target they have for that rate, they achieve it without, uh, uh, you know, big purchases being needed. So it works nice in that way. That cannot be done in, uh, uh, in the euro area because we don't have a uh, European uh, bond market that is unified with a big safe asset, we would need not euro bonds in the proper sense of the world, of the word, but we would need a safe asset which can be engineered, that would be for other discussion, but can be created without mutualization, without then the element that made euro bonds being refused in the past, that could be built, there are proposals on the table, uh, and we don't have that. So. The ECB could not provide 19 targets for the 19 uh, um, the sovereign bonds uh, of the member countries. That would not be uh, feasible uh, or, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, acceptable. And also, of course, not choosing the one or the other, either the ones with, uh, you know, uh, uh, big... Uh, um, bigger vulnerabilities or less vulnerabilities, that would not be appropriate at all uh, because there would remain the question of uh, the spreads among them. So the only thing that uh, the ECB can do along these lines, it's not the same, would be one day to say, uh, well, from now on, we will concentrate our purchases on 10-year bonds in all jurisdictions. Uh, and that may be uh, even perhaps necessary if one day they face the problem of having already such a stock of sovereign debt that exceeds the limits that uh, the ECB uh, defines uh, and so to uh, have lower amounts to be purchased they can concentrate them on uh, say 10-year bonds. That will have an impact on those uh, rates uh, but it's not as perfect uh, or as easy as uh, in Japan or uh, countries that have a national uh, bond market. I would slightly disagree because, of course, you are completely right with what you say, but there exists a benchmark bond yield for the euro area. 
and you could try to stabilize this benchmark bond here. So kind of some kind of average that you stabilize. And I think then it's not, of course, it's not so easy to, to forecast for the markets, but why not, why not target this benchmark yield? Well, because it won't have any impact on the yields of each of the member countries. And you could still have, after doing that, you know, a big divergence and the policy of the ECB would not then be uh, contemplating in a level field way the problem of all member countries of the euro. So it doesn't work. Uh, in well, but, 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 but that's the same problem like the short term rate. It's all also a one fits all rate. It's also an average. Uh, so I think it's just the logic of this one fits all thing well, that I think what, what you can do with this yield curve control is, and I think right now it's not, not the top, it's not topical. I think yield curve control you don't need right now. Yield curve control becomes relevant once you get out of the crisis, once everything stabilizes, and once central banks start with the first tentative increases of short term rates. Then you, you need yield curve control to have to prevent this short term increase to transmit into a strong increase of the bond yields. And, and this you can prevent with this kind of benchmark uh, policy. Huh? Uh, well, uh, we uh, indeed slightly disagree. Okay. Okay. I before closing this session, um, there is a, one last question from our um, attendees, and I would like um, to give the floor um, to Heike Jopkes, who wants to pose the last question. Uh huh. Please. Heike, are you already here? Otherwise, I um, give a brief overview already. Um, it's tackling um, the inflation targeting strategy. Um, but if um, Heike is not posing it herself, I will just um, read it to you. Um, she says that uh, both of you um, seem to agree on inflation targeting as a strategy for the ECB, yet uh, Vito Constancio seems uh, to be against trying to use negative interest rates on reserves, um, yes. question mark. Um, would Professor Bofinger agree, question mark? Well, I must say I was never so convinced that the negative interest rates had such a huge impact economically, and it had a, had a politically devastating impact. Uh, and so I was always a little bit skeptical whether the, the, the positive, additional positive impact by the negative interest rate is, is for, compared to the political costs associated with this negative interest rate, especially in Germany, I was never 100% uh, really convinced of this. Well, I was in the ECB at the time, as uh, as we as you know, but uh, uh, I became, with time, uh, more and more uh, concerned with the uh, um, spillover effects of the policy and more skeptical about the effectiveness. So initially, it happened in a more almost natural way because we brought down the uh, policy rate to zero uh, in uh, 2014, and then having a corridor uh, implied that the, uh, uh, the uh, deposit facility rate, the, uh, the floor of the corridor, came down to minus 0 0.1, which was very mild mm -hmm. and not uh, indeed a problem. But as it uh, inc was increased over time, I was not a big fan. Uh, and uh, after I left, I became openly uh, uh, saying that the instrument should not be further used because indeed it has uh, negative effects on uh, financial stability, on the financial sector. And I don't believe that the efficiency of changing the level of interest rate is the same when you go negative than when uh, you do it on the positive side. 
uh, as some economists uh, believe. Uh, I don't. Uh, and so that's why I uh, turned against using further the instrument. I understand, of course, that it is uh, delicate and uh, it's not the moment now to start changing uh, very gradually that possible. That will have to wait for better conditions, of course, but certainly not uh, using that instrument further is totally justified. Uh, thanks oh, a lot uh, again. Um, I, I was told that we are running out of time, uh, but maybe it's just one last sentence, Professor Wolfinger, to reply on that. No, I agree. Okay. So, but, but I don't see so much the, the financial stability issue because the Bundesbank has just shown now that the impact of these negative interest rates on bank profitability is not that huge. So I, I would see it more as a political problem because in, in Germany it has created so much negative, uh, so such a negative image for the mm -hmm. for the ECB, which, which I think is also something that matters. Mm -hmm. Well, time, uh, we are running out of time. This last panel, it, it passed so quickly. Um, I'm really thank you again for your great presentations. Um, you gave us a lot of ideas how you, the strategy of the ECB, the Federal Reserve, how they should react in the future to overcome the crisis, how to change policies and what could be done. And we've seen that um, also in the future, Monetary policy can't be the only solution um, to drive us forward and out of the current crisis. And I think that is one thing that you all had in common, in spite of also showing us different examples of experiences of um, the um, Japanese um, situation, the Eurozone, or also the US. Um, I also thank the audience and also for your for your great participation, for your questions and the remarks that we had on the live stream and also um, in um, the live chat. And uh, before closing this session, I also want to remind you that tomorrow the um, conference continues at uh, 2 p.m. CET um, with the panel on inequality. So I wish you. Um, good night, all the best, and I'll see you again tomorrow at the conference.